Looks like we're good to go here now, so I'm gonna, I'll start up. Um, the, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind, and it kind of left my mind as I sat here waiting um, for this to come up, but uh, I'm reminded of two years ago, maybe it was a year ago when I was in San Francisco, and the second day in the morning, Dries gets up and he stands in front of everybody and he's just quiet for a moment and he says, you're all still here and you're all still very intimidating. And I kind of feel like that. People were saying, well, just imagine them naked. And I thought, well, that's a great way to get me off the stage as quickly as possible. A whole bunch of, you know, naked nerds is not, not my thing, apparently. So, um, so my presentation's on damn quick Drupal, um, how to make Drupal performance scale like a rock star. Now, you might find yourself wondering, well, who's the rock star? Is the Drupal the rock star? Am I, am, I, am I the rock star? The little dude's the rock star. That's, that's the way it is. So you're just aspiring to be as cool as the, uh, the guy with the bagpipes. But um, no, it really is that I, I do believe that Drupal is a rock star. I think that Drupal is an amazing um, content management system. It's fast, it's scalable, it does everything I want it to do. Um, before coming to Drupal, I had built five other content management systems. So I kind, of, I kind of knew all the stuff not to do at that point, and I was quite glad to find very little of that in Drupal. And we sort of have a, a thing at, uh, I work at Acquia, and we have a thing where we say, you know, if you build one or two content management systems, then you're good. Three sort of the hump, but three you should be realizing you shouldn't be doing this anymore. And if you go over three, it's a negative. So unfortunately, I've, I've kind of gone that way, but they hired me anyway, so I must, have, must do something right. So the first thing is kind of, you know, why me? Why am I doing this presentation and why did I pick this topic? Well, I've been writing web apps since 2001. Um, I've built CMSs that some of them at their peak powered 1,500 websites. One of them uh, did automotive websites. Um, I've run things called auto malls. Those are kind of like auto trader for, for those of you familiar with that. They, some of them would have 500,000 vehicles in them and you had to return results from a database under 500 milliseconds. You could have a query that would be, you know, querying a database full of cars with maybe as many as 12 different parameters. And you have to get that result with maybe thousands of results back within half a second. Otherwise, the site would just load too slow. So I have a lot of experience in tweaking databases and understanding how they work. Um, I've built a lot of websites, a lot of websites in Drupal. Um, I've built websites that in Drupal that have to handle things like five posts a second, which when you're running something like five posts a second, Varnish cannot save you anymore. You know, you have to actually have Drupal running properly and you have to have a really good stack. Um, and I've also, you know, I've launched Drupal websites that had, came up and then died within 90 seconds because of load. So I figure, you know, I know what not to do and I've learned how to make that not happen again. So that's sort of why, why, why I wanted to do this and why, why I think I can, you know, give you guys some information to help you out with, with building a really performance Drupal website. Now, I know a lot of you probably think to yourself, you look at all these Drupal websites out there and you think, like, you look at, like, you know, White House, you look at um, maybe Acquia, hopefully, .com, um, since that's one of the websites I run, and you look at a lot of other Drupal websites and you're like, man, these things are fast. They, they respond quickly, they perform really well. How come mine doesn't do that? It's like they downloaded this damn quick Drupal distribution and I downloaded molasses Drupal or something like that. Like that's the version that I got. And I don't know where I got it from. It's just, I went to drupal.org and apparently there was a link that I clicked and it was the wrong one. So the question is, you know, why are many Drupal websites slow and fail? And there's four main reasons why that happens. The first one is full page renders. That's when every single time someone makes a request to a page, you're forcing Drupal to go out and build every individual block, and you're forcing it to go out and figure out, you know, if there's URL redirects on links and load the menu system, all, well, theoretically, you can't actually do that unless you're doing things really wrong. Load the menu system from scratch each time and ge generate all the HTML from scratch every time. You really, if you're doing that to all the time, if every single page has to do that, you're literally looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 SQL queries per page to load a page, which is just, there's no way that's going to perform well, there's no way that's going to scale. The other issue that really causes people a lot of pain is the fact that they're serving dynamic content to anonymous users. So you've got, you know, the front page of your website, say you're running a news site, and you get, you know, I don't know, uh, 10 users a second coming to that website. And for some reason or other, you feel that I need to have the latest up-to-date content for these users, so every single one of those people gets a fresh page. But they don't need it. You know, if, if your up front page updates every minute for every five minutes, or depending on how busy your site is every hour even, that may be plenty. You know, some of those blocks, they may not need to be, you know, every single request that you get a fresh block in there. So that's one of the other things that causes a lot of pain. Um, excessive, slow, and non-optimized database queries. This is the, it's tied for number one with why Drupal websites are slow. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's both the good, the bane and the boon of, of uh, Drupal is that you don't really have to know SQL all that well. The problem is that a lot of people that have built um, some contrib modules and written a lot of their own code for Drupal don't know SQL all that well. And if you don't optimize your SQL, then you're simply not gonna have a website that runs fast. 
um, or you just don't, don't use um, SQL and you might be able to save yourself that way as well. And the last one is naughty modules. There are naughty modules out there that are doing bad things that are going to make your website run slow. And you have to know what those are. Um, you have to you know, look at the issue queues for modules, look at um, how many sites use them and whatnot, and really make some decisions about, um, about whether or not you want to use these modules. But there's one thing, there's one thing that is the answer to pretty much every single issue that you may have with your Drupal website running slow, and that thing is cache. You have to forgive my horrible little picture here. I was trying to find a gnome that had cache, and all I could find was a geocache gnome. So I figured that was close enough. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I've even even last night I was talking to some folks, and they were saying that my Drupal site runs slow. So my you know my my admins are trying to do this stuff with caching, and and they they seem to think the caching is a bad thing. They seem to think like, oh, we couldn't figure out how to do it right, so now we've got a cache. And the funny thing is, a lot of people don't realize is that the people that are doing it right that make their sites really fast. Their site they're fast because they're caching. There's not some sort of like secret thing that they're doing. Well, maybe some of them have a secret thing. They just haven't shared it with me. But as far as I know, there's no secret thing. And um, I've, I've built a lot of websites, and I work with a lot of people that run a lot of really big websites. And what it really comes down to is, is caching, is how well you're caching, when you're caching, is your caching optimized. And you don't have to feel bad that you have to fall back on caching. Caching is a good thing. Um, in fact, I'm not going to read this because this is a tongue twister, but you got to cache. And your cache should be in a cache, and you should cache that too. And if you think about it, the entire internet is just a big, long series of caches. Your browser caches, your, uh, your DNS entries are cached. You know, the BGP routes you go across on the internet are cached. There's probably reverse proxies in the middle of all that caching. There's a CDN caching. Um, there's, you know, when you get to the actual web server, there's, you know, there's, things are cached on the disk, things are cached in RAM, things are cached in databases. Everything is cached. And the reason why everything is cached is because stuff is slow. If you actually had to load a web page and between you and the web server, nothing was cached, it just would never happen. You would never see that web page load. That's how, really how slow things actually are without cache. They just don't work. And of course, this is the obligatory lolcat screen. Drupal wants cache too. Has to have it. Without cache, Drupal wouldn't, wouldn't even operate. So the question is, how does Drupal cache? Because a lot of you, you, you probably, you may think, oh, I go to the performance page and I see this little checkbox that says cache pages for anonymous users or if I'm, I'm in Drupal 6, I see the radio drop downs for what type of cache I want to run. But that's actually not the only cache that Drupal runs. There's actually many, many caches that Drupal is running all the time. Um, a lot of core modules instantiate caches. A lot of um, contrib modules instantiate caches. And they create these cache tables in your database. And if you ever look at the tables, you'll actually see a lot of like cache, you know, cache filter, cache node. Um, the vast majority of them actually all use the same schema too. There's a couple that are different, but um, they're, they're pretty straightforward in how they do their caching. And um, successive versions of Drupal have cached more and more all the time. Um, in Drupal 5, for example, um, very little was cached. In Drupal 6, they started caching a lot of the module lists and whatnot. And in Drupal 7, even a lot of the, um, the hooks, like, uh, like the, for example, your theme registry gets a lot more things get cached in that. So that Drupal has to do less and less stuff on the fly, which is why, by and large, Drupal is actually running faster and faster with each successful, successive version. Now, technically, Drupal 7 runs a little bit slower, but that's if you start doing a lot of crazy things that um, all the new modules add to core will allow you to do. But really, um, the, the fact that they've added in a lot of caches helps a lot. And they've also done a lot of work in successive versions of Drupal to make it run better with more nodes. Um, for example, Drupal, Drupal 6, once you start getting over the 10,000 node mark, you're going to start having problems. With Drupal 7, you can actually get up to 100,000 nodes without any, any big issues at all. So there's a lot, of, a lot of good things in there. One thing of note, too, is that the things I'm talking about in this presentation, the vast majority of them apply to both Drupal 6 and 7. Um, there's a couple things that are specific, and I'll call those out. But I really wanted to, to make it as, as, as broad as possible, because I know a lot of people are still running big Drupal 6 websites. And they, you know, a lot of them, they probably want them to run faster. So how does Drupal use, use the cache in the database? Well, it uses these cache tables to store data. And it uh, loads this file called cache inc. You'll find it in your includes folder. And amongst other things, it defines these two um, functions called cache set and cache get. And they take the same order of, of, of variables, grab data, stick it in your cache, get data out of cache, provide it out. Um, it's pluggable as well. So you can actually create your own caching. You're like, you know what, I don't like the way the Drupal 1 does this. I don't like the fact that storing it in the table like this, I've got this better way of doing it. You can come up with your own better way of actually storing your cache. And you can do it. Um, if you use a module like Cache Router, for example, or if you use the Drupal 7, um, object-oriented way of doing it, you can actually make it so that different things store in different caches. So for example, you could make it so that your, your filter cache stores in APC and your node cache stores in memcache or something like that. You can define you know, exactly where each one goes. 
And in fact, that's what a lot of um, a lot of these modules do that um, give you some uh, performance improvements to cache. I've got a couple of them listed there, like um, uh, one's called Cache, ironically. Cache router, memcache, APC, these are all modules that install. And then you go into your settings.php file and you say, okay, for here's my, my settings um, include code for this particular cache module. I'm going to say I want this particular thing to cache here and this thing to cache there. Um, those, are, those are big improvements. I'm going to get into exactly how those work. But what I really want to start out by showing you guys is sort of just how Drupal caches, so you some of the queries it runs, show you how you can optimize those queries, cause those queries not to run at all, uh, make your website faster in some cases, and, um, and get a website so they can serve pages in under a second, because that's really the goal. You really want it so that when, when Drupal is done with its HTML and it sends its HTML back to Apache or Nginx or whatever you're using for your web server, that it can do it in less than a second. If you start going over a second, that's a big red flag. You should really never have that happen because you really want your web pages to be loading for your end users in three seconds. And most of us know that you know you, you design this great website and then you know the marketing guys, I know you're out there. You, you have JavaScript includes you want me to put in a website right now, I know you do. You know, they're going to give you a whole bunch of JS files, and they're going to say, we want all these cool images and whatnot. And before you know it, the front page of your website has like 80 assets that it's got to load after it gets that HTML. So that HTML needs to be delivered in a second to, uh, you know, or at least be sent out in a second so that everything else that can happen needs to happen. So I did a bunch of testing to try and make that, uh, to show you guys how you can improve that. And I got the cheapest server I could get my hands on. I got a, one of Rackspace's um, cloud servers. It costs $10 a month. It's a quad opter on. I don't recall the speed. It's got almost no RAM, which I thought was great for a test because we'll try and do this on as little RAM as possible. Um, and just running Apache, MySQL, um, PHP, just whatever you know. The I, I ran CentOS, whatever the you know the um, the yum install gave me, and no reverse proxy. So that's important to know. Nothing like Varnish or Squid is involved in this. I really want to just do my tests with um, exactly what what the web server and what Drupal were going to do. I didn't want anything in front caching it. So the tools that you really want to use whenever you're doing anything like this, they're pretty straightforward. They're not that hard to get your hands on. Um, the Devel module is key. Um, I'm sure that all of you know what the Devel module is and, uh, and you're using it, not on your production websites, but you're using it. And if you don't know, just don't tell anybody because just pretend you know what the Devel module is and use it and then go quickly look it up on Drupal.org. Um, you want to use it to determine what your page load times is, what your memory consumption is, see your queries. And also the newest versions of Devel in integrate with this thing called uh, um, I call it XHProf, I think it's probably called HProf because I've heard people say that. It's this amazing tool that actually graphs out for you and draws diagrams of all the functions and calls that your pages make and how long everything takes. It integrates with the Devel module and it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll show you guys some screens of what it looks like. Uh, New Relic's a third party service that can be really good for gathering a lot of this data about how well your site's performing. Um, it's a, a daemon that runs on your server and then sort of watches what's going on and reports it back to a website that gives you a lot of data. And of course, the good old ones like Apache Benchmark, Bombard, Siege, JMeter, um, some paid services, Sosta and Blitz are services that can do a lot of benchmarking for you. But for what we're going to be doing here, I'm actually just going to be using just the most basic, easy to get your hands on tools. We're using the Devel module to gather some stats, and then we're going to use Apache Benchmark to see how well things work um, after we've made some tweaks to a site. And just for you guys, just for a couple of um, terms, there's cold cache and warm cache. I'll refer to that a couple of times. You probably hear people saying that cold cache just means there's nothing in cache yet. You know, the site hasn't loaded, so the cache tables are, or, or you just click the clear cache button on the performance page, your caches are empty. Warm cache, theoretically, is when everything is in cache. Sometimes it takes a couple of page loads to get everything in cache as well, to get your cache warmed up. In addition, you know, things like Apache actually has a cache, MySQL has a cache, and that when you first fire up MySQL, you're actually going to have a cold cache, and you're going to want to get that warmed up. Key value stores are things you've probably heard about. They're things like APC, Cassandra, Memcache, Redis. Um, all they do is they have a key and a value. There are more complex ways to implement them as well, but really that in their basic state, that's what they are. And there are also a lot of things called NoSQL. And there's opcode caches and compilers. Um, APC, E Accelerator, Ion Cubex cache, there's a whole, a whole pile of them. And what they all do is they compile your PHP in advance so that it doesn't have to be done on the fly every time. That's sort of a thing that a lot of, you know, a lot of hardcore programmers who've been do dealing with other languages, they come to PHP and they're like, my god, you know, why can't I actually compile this in advance to see if I have syntax errors and whatnot? And it's, and if you think about it, it's actually kind of crazy. Every single time your Apache or whatever comes along and says to PHP, says, hey, you know, here, give me this page, um, PHP says, okay, let me find the files, finds all the files, does all the includes, compiles it, optimizes it, and then hands it, hands it back. It does it every single time. But the files are the same every single time. So there's actually no logical reason to do that. And something like APC will actually cause you to stop having to do that. APC will compile all your PHP and then store it in memory. So it doesn't have to be done every single time. 
And that's, that's like a no-brainer. Like if you don't have APC running on a web server, you're really just, you're asking for your web pages to use four times as much memory to load as they normally would. You just, you have to use APC. It's, if I was to say that there's just one thing that you could do to make it so your website's more robust, that would be it. It'd be to run APC. And it just, you just do a Peckle install to get it. Or sorry, it's, uh, depending on your OS, some, some of them actually have them as, um, as, I think, yum, you can just pull it right down. So I want to show you what sort of a calf set looks like, and unfortunately that appears to be a little bit out of focus. But those big giant blocks over there are actually the stuff that's getting um, put into the database when cache set is called. And what you probably can't read very well here is it says it executed 330 queries that took 700 and I can see it better here, 775 milliseconds, and the page was rendered in 3.3 milliseconds or 3.3 seconds. So that's obviously not that good. You wouldn't want a page that took 3.3 milliseconds just to get out of out the door with Drupal. You want that page, of course, to be you know rendered like I said in well under a second. So, but this isn't this isn't how it normally is because this is when um, when cache set is being run. So the you know all the HTML, all these variables are all being plugged into the cache. Once the uh, the cache has been has been set, you'll see that there's there's um, a lot less queries. We're down to actually 155 queries, and they actually all executed in 350 uh, milliseconds, and the page was rendered in 1.5 seconds. But you can still see all those pesky cache get calls in there. And actually, if I was to show you, just scroll down and show you the whole page, that the, this is the devel module for those of you don't, that haven't used this before, showing all the SQL queries that were run, you'll see that there's probably about 50 or so cache gets that run on this page, which means one third of all the SQL queries that ran to generate this page were cache gets. And you're thinking, well, it's a key value store. It's, it's, a, it's a key with a bunch of data attached to it. Does that really need, do I really need to be firing up TCPIP, IP, making a connection to MySQL, having it check my query? Um, seeing if, if that data is in cache, if not, pulling the data out of its cache, putting it into cache, that's just a lot of work just for some of this information. So the thing that you really want to do is you want to um, figure out ways to get around that. Now this is just another, um, another screenshot. This is actually after MySQL has done all of its caching on its end, and you'll see that the, the times were actually a lot slower. Before a lot of those cache gets were highlighted in red, but now MySQL has actually cached a bunch of stuff too, so it's running a lot better. But it's still not great. So what we want to do then is we want to use a key value store. And I mentioned a couple of them before. Um, the bigger ones that you hear are, most of the time are APC or memcache. APC, aside from being a, um, a uh, add-on that can compile your code, also has what's called its user cache, and it can actually store variables in memory. The really cool thing about APC is that it runs in the exact same memory space as the PHP process, so it doesn't have to make a TCP IP connection to get data. PHP just says, hey, give me this data, and APC says, there it is. And it's pretty quick. The problem is if you're running your site on more than one web server, then the APC can no longer share memory. And so if, you run, if, you wanna, if you're running multiple web servers, you can then use something like memcache, and you can say, here's my memcache server out here, and then both servers can connect to it. Which is really neat, actually, because that means multiple web heads can actually be generating cache entries and storing them so that the other web head can then access it. And do, otherwise, if you don't do something like that, each web head has to keep generating generating caches, and if you think about that, that's um, not ideal because one does all this work to generate this cache and the other one doesn't have access to it and it's got to do all this work to generate cache. And you've actually, in some respects, actually increased the amount of page, the amount of time it takes to load a page. So if you run multiple web heads, you really need to make sure that they are sharing cache. Um, if you don't do that, you're, you're, you're asking for some pain. So after adding a key value store, in this particular instance, I used the cache router module to give myself uh, APC as my cache, because I'm just running one web head here, it's not a problem. And I'm actually down to 107 queries now, and they executed in 36 milliseconds. The entire page was generated and sent out the door in 2.12 milliseconds, which is very nice. That means I'm actually, you know, I'm a fifth of a second now to generate this page. And an important thing to note, too, is that this is a bit of a, a painful page. This is a front page of websites that's loading 50 nodes with comment counts. Um, it's showing, showing attachments. It's, um, I'm running the admin module, I've got Devel running, I've got a lot of stuff going on here that you, that you typically wouldn't even be this, this mean to your website on a regular basis. I'm also not running it as admin, so there's a bunch of access, uh, node access queries that are running in here as well. But I think I've, I've got a pretty good result here. I'm down to, you know, down to you know, 100, 100 queries, it's not, it's not horrible. Um, it's pretty fast, but I want more. So I'm gonna go and check and see if MySQL is actually properly caching. Now in this particular example here, it's not. And really, this is a page actually that Drupal provides. If you, in Drupal, actually I don't know where it is in Drupal 7, I haven't found it yet, but in Drupal 6, if you go to your status page, your site status page, it'll show you the MySQL version you're running, you click on that link, it'll take you to this page. And if you look on that, and you look down at the bottom there, and you see query cache, queries in cache, zero, cache hits zero, cache inserts zero, you know you're in trouble. 
that means that MySQL, which has a very good cache actually, is not being used at all, which is, which is bad. And interestingly enough, this is the, the result of a default MySQL install for, um, for CentOS. The defaults that came down didn't put anything in there to enable any caching whatsoever. So uh, I didn't really, you know, you don't want to rely on that. And in fact, one of the things that I've talked about with a couple of people recently is that, you know, there's, there's, don't assume that the default settings are good. And also there's another thing to keep in mind is there's no one size fits all group of settings for, for things like Apache or MySQL or whatnot. If there was a one size fits all setting, they would just come with that and we'd never have to tweak it. We have to tweak it because every server is different, every environment's different, um, every website's different, the things you're trying to do are all different. So I put in just a, uh, these are just the settings I used on my website when I was doing my optimization. I had to keep it pretty small because I only had 256 megs of RAM. So I couldn't have Apache go and chew up, you know, all of the RAM and leave nothing left over for PHP to use. So I just gave it some sane settings in here. And these are, you know, if you were to pick seven settings that you have to set on your MySQL server, you just simply must set these settings. These would be them. Well, I guess unless, unless you're not running MySQL, then you can ignore that one. Um, but key buffer size is the key cache. So every time you have a table that's got indexes in it, you know, that key cache is where those indexes get stored. If you don't have that set, then every single time you run a query, um, my, my school has got to go and load the indexes off the hard drive, which isn't really that much of a cache after a while. It's, I mean, your hard drive will probably cache it for you as well, but it's not that well optimized. Query cache caches the results of queries. So if you have two queries that are identical, MySQL doesn't go out and say, hey, I'm going to go hit the hard drive and, uh, and find out what, this, what the data is going to be for this query. It actually just simply says, I ran this query two seconds ago. I'm pretty sure the result's going to be the same then as it is now unless the table's been changed. And it'll just give you that result right there. Query cache limit just limits the size of the query result that can be in there. I really hope that none of us are running queries that return results greater than two megs, um, on a regular basis at least. You, know, you don't want that on the front page of your website. Table cache is a pretty neat thing too. MySQL actually has the ability to load up all of the tables and just stick them in RAM. Um, and it uses your table cache size to, uh, to, or number to determine how many tables it can do with that, that with at once. And if you want to really know how well this is working out for you, phpMyAdmin has a great page that shows you all this information, or you can just run the show status command at a MySQL prompt, and you can see the setting called open tables. In fact, I think this page shows it as well. Uh, nope, it doesn't show it, but, so you can, but you can find it other ways. And if you see that your, your MySQL is constantly having to open tables, that means that these tables are not in cache, and it's actually taking a table out of cache, putting a new table into cache, and then constantly doing that over and over again. So you, got, you actually, you, you really need to watch that setting. You need to make sure that um, it's not constantly opening tables and the table cache that you have is good enough. Sort buffer size is pretty important. If you don't have a buffer for MySQL to do sorts in, it's gonna create temporary tables on disk and do your sorts there. And that's bad. You do not wanna have to do that. And a great way to see if that's happening is to, we'll just jump back a couple of slides here. If you see a query in here that's horribly slow, like it's got like, you know, those numbers on the left, you're seeing something that's like 50, 80, 100 milliseconds, just grab that query, put the word explain in front of it, and then run it at the MySQL prompt. And it'll actually tell you if it's able to, if it's using temporary tables to do sorting, or if, it's, if it can't find an index or something like that. And that, that's, that's incredibly important. And that's sort of where I got back to one of the things I said at the beginning is that don't assume that everything was done perfectly for you. Especially if your site's running slow, you want to, you need to, you need to look at those things. You need to investigate the uh, the queries that are going on and make sure that everything is properly optimized. And then the same thing here, um, MySQL sort buffer is just another setting. The first one is used by InnoDB. The second one's used by MySQL. I believe it's possible that one overrides the other in later versions. And then the temp table size is the size of temporary tables that MySQL will make in RAM. If you make it, and if you end up, um, you can, there's, a, there's a, in the show status, it will actually tell you if it has to create temporary tables on disk a lot to do, to do joins and whatnot. So you want to make sure you have those set. So again, if you, if, you, um, if you have a server, if you have a MySQL server and you have not looked at these settings and you don't know what they are, you need to look at these settings and you need to understand them. If you don't do that, you simply are going to have a very hard time making a website that performs well. Um, I'm not going to give you a lot more detail on this. If you just look Google like MySQL performance, you're going to find like the entire first page is going to be full of websites that describe these settings and tell you you should use this much of your machine's available memory for this setting and this much for this setting. Um, but they're, they're absolutely key. So after I've done that, I have no more slow queries. In fact, a lot of these queries that were taking 10, or you know, they were taking, uh, you know, they had like double digit numbers, I'll just say in here. A lot of them were actually down to just like single digit numbers or even lower. Um, if I scroll down here, you'll see that none of them are highlighted in red before, when on every single screen, if I scroll down, there were still some that were highlighted in red. And now my, my queries are down to 17 milliseconds to run all of my queries for my website, which is awesome. 
So now I know that MySQL is no longer a bottleneck on my site. So I'm good. I can now look at some other things. And so one of the things I mentioned before was, um, was APC. APC, I just, I just can't, I can't say enough about APC. I love it. If I did, wasn't already married, I'd want to like seriously start taking APC out some dates. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, what it does is it's going to compile all of your, all of your PHP code and then it's going to serve that compiled version. Um, it's, it's awesome. It has this other really cool setting too. One of the things that it does is before it serves that compiled version, it goes and checks to make sure your file hasn't changed before it does that. So it's like, okay, the file hasn't changed, so my compiled version is still good. But for the majority of us, you know, we're running using source control, we're not releasing stuff like crazy. You know, when we, when we cut a tag, we deploy that to our server, that code's not gonna change. It's gonna be the same thing until like, you know, next week when we cut our next tag. So there's a really cool setting called stat zero that you can set, or stat, and you set it to zero, I should say. You set that in your apc.ini file, and it no longer runs that check. So it's a really neat thing to do. You can actually, you can actually um, blow up your website, and if that is set to stat zero, it's going to delete your files, and your website will still load because my or APC actually has them all cached in memory. It doesn't even check the disk anymore, which is great because you, know, you, you don't want to hit the disk. If you can get away with not hitting the disk, you want to do it. Um, and other neat things too are Drupal modules such as Cache Router and the APC module and other ones um, will actually integrate with APC so that if you were to go and clear cache in Drupal, it knows to go and clear the APC cache as well. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, I've got to go and like restart Apache when I want to do this stuff. Like if you just hit the clear cache button in Drupal and you know, the, the, um, the Cache Inc module that comes with Cache Router, for example, just says, okay, we're using APC and it goes off and makes the call to clear the APC cache. So it's, it's pretty sweet. The other thing you get with APC is you get this really cool page that gives you all these stats on uh, how much of your, your APC cache you're using, if it's fragmented. It's also got some hits and misses in here so you can see if you're getting good hit rates and good misses and you can optimize and tweak from there on in. Um, it also shows all of your stats down below. And in addition, you can see that it's got, you can probably, I don't know if you can see that perfectly well up there, but you've got system cache entries and user cache entries. So system cache is the opcode cache where it's caching all the pages. And then user cache entries is where it's actually caching like your key value stores. You can clear those independently as well. Um, so it's pretty neat. Um, I've actually seen that people have made this for memcache as well. So you guys use memcache for some of the stuff. There's a page like this that you can get from memcache, which is, is pretty awesome. So the result of all of these tweaks and tests when it's all said and done is that this page now runs 97 queries. Oh, there's another thing I did in the middle in here that I forgot to, um, when I made all my screenshots, is that another big table, once you eliminate all the caching tables, the table that's gonna cause you the most pain is the session table. Because every single time some module decides to store value in the session, it, uh, whenever Drupal hits a hit hook exit, it goes out and it says, okay, here's all my session stuff, and it goes and puts it in the session table for that user. And you'll end up with just massive inserts going into the session table. And the problem is that, especially if you're running MyISM, which you shouldn't be doing, you should be running an ODB. Um, especially if you're running MyISM, you're locking the table during that insert, and then every user on your website is waiting for this, you know, this session insert, tape, insert call to get it done. So um, APC and Memcache um, both have options where you can take your session table and you can stick that into those caches as well, and you're no longer doing those writes to, um, to MySQL. And in fact, you'll notice that I went down from 107 to 97 queries, um, which is great, especially considering that we started out at three, over 300 queries to load this page. Um, and now the page is being sent out the door in 180 milliseconds, and our queries are only taking 14 milliseconds. And again, like I said, this is a front page. It's got a lot of stuff on it. I'm using a, 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 a very slim theme, so obviously if I was to be running some big monstrous theme, I would probably see a lot of my numbers double in there. Um, but for, this, for the purposes of this test, I wanted to show just really what, what settings are affecting, uh, what kind of sort of core settings there are that you can speed things up. And then for a single node, if we hit just one node, we'll see that 33 queries, um, 5.87 milliseconds, and my speed ironically was a little bit longer, but that was probably because something was getting written into cache. Probably the page got written, written into cache, and it was 192 milliseconds. So the other thing too is you want to see, well, how fast is this for anonymous users? So a great tool for that, if you guys, no one's ever used that before, is to use, um, get the Firebug um, extension for Firefox and hit the net panel. And if you hit the net, net panel, you can actually see all of the files on your website and how long they take to load. And we'll see that our page itself, to get out the door with Apache and everything, took 200 and 299 milliseconds, which is pretty good. That means that my browser made a request, went out to Apache, Apache talked to PHP, got the result back, sent it back to my browser, and I got it 300 milliseconds, which is good. That's what I want. And in fact, my entire page loaded in on one, under one second, which is what I want. Except I've made a classic mistake here. I forgot to hit aggregation for JS and, and CSS files. So if I do that, we'll actually see that I now am only making 11 requests to my web server, which is awesome. And all of us forget that sometimes. It's okay. I, I do it too. So a little bit more on Drupal caching. So we've talked a little bit about how Drupal is doing all of this caching, where it's putting it, how we can improve our sites by sticking it somewhere else. And so you wonder, well, when does Drupal create cache? 
The answer is all the time. You know, your a new module uh, makes this change to the uh, the variables table. Well, the variables table is cached. So you go and you hit the save page on the module. Drupal goes out and it clears the uh, the variables cache entry out of the cache table, builds a new one, sticks it into that cache table. Um, you know, you, may, you change a menu item. Well, that menu cache is then updated all the time. Caches are being updated. And so the que next question is, well, when does Drupal clear cache? And the answer to that is all the time. Drupal is constantly clearing things out of cache, putting new things into cache. Now, some of the things that are kind of interesting here that, um, that I was actually not even fully aware of even up to like a year ago is that um, there are things that get cleared out of cache at times you just would not expect. So for example, if you've gone into um, the performance page and you've said um, cache blocks or you, you've set on Drupal 6, you've set the, uh, the cache setting to default or in Drupal 7, you've hit the cache pages for anonymous users. What that actually does is on hook exit, Drupal takes all the HTML it just rendered um, to deliver that page and it sticks it into a cache table so that it doesn't have to keep doing that over and over again, which is fantastic. Um, and again, if we do something like APC or memcache, it didn't stick it into a cache table, it stuck into a key value store up on a server somewhere that's gonna save us even more time. But if you save a node, Drupal calls this function called cl cache clear all. And what cache clear all does without any parameters passed to is it wipes the node and the block caches. So you, you're like, you know, your site's being hammered, you're like, yay, it's standing up well, everything's going well. And one of the editors is like, oh crap, we got slash dotted and I have this mistake in there. So that editor goes, they modify that node and they hit save and your block cache and your, and your page cache for your site are wiped out. And now the next thousand people that are about to hit your website are all waiting, you know, maybe six or seven seconds for the first person that hits a page again for the caches to all be rebuilt, which is obviously not good at all. The reason, of course, why Drupal does that is say, for example, you've got a front page with a bunch of views displaying, you know, it's a bunch of nodes on it, and you've got a list of nodes on the front page and whatnot, maybe a couple of blocks, and they, maybe they pull data from a node as well. Because Drupal doesn't really know or, or, you know, it's not feasible for it to keep track of exactly what nodes are stored in the front page, which so just says if you modify a node, I have no idea where data from this node could possibly be called from at any time, so I just gotta clear all the caches, because chances are data from this node showed up somewhere. So that's why, or not all the caches, the block and the, the node caches. So that's why it does that. But you can get around this. You can save yourself from accidentally stumbling and, and falling on this particular issue. And what that is, is on your performance page, there's this little drop down that says minimum cache lifetime. And that is your savior. You know, that thing there, it, that setting wants you to set it to something other than zero. It's desperate for you to do it. It's calling out. It's like, give me at least five minutes. So whenever cache clear all is called, it says, I'm gonna clear cache for everything that has been, that's older than that setting which is what can really save you, you know, when, from a lot of things. If you think about all the content editors doing things on your website, every single time they're saving a node, they're clearing the block in the node cache for every single page in your site. So give that thing a setting, giving it, give it at least five minutes. And that way things like your front page and whatnot are gonna always be cached for five minutes. Now there's some people that say, oh my goodness, five minutes is a long time for, for this page to be cached. But keep in mind that's just for anonymous users. Authenticated users are still getting a fresh page. So if you think about it, if you've got like a news site it's okay for that front page to be cached for five minutes. It really is, I promise you. You know, No one's gonna cry if, if that node title that's in that one block over on the side doesn't update for five minutes. Or if it is imperative that it does, you know, go and deliberately hit the clear cache button. That will do it. Don't let fate sort of just have its way with you. Um, I would strongly recommend setting that setting to like an hour or even six hours if you can get away with it. Um, and just be smart about knowing when to clear cache you know, by hitting the, the clear all caches button. Um, so again, that's, that's an easy win. You know, set that setting. Um, set a page cache, you know. You may not have that many anonymous users, but still set that page cache so that they don't have to, uh, so you don't have to be generating, you know, fresh pages for them all the time. And then the last thing is to double check your headers. Make sure that the headers that you're, that you're sending out to the browsers don't say things like no cache or don't have a max age because those are the things that determine whether or not the browser is gonna be able to cache the, cache the page or not. And if the browser can't cache the page, the browser's making a fresh request every single time and you can save yourself from that. Um, in Drupal 6, you have to install Pressflow to get the option to have a max age, and in, uh, or you can just, a series of patches you can use as well. And in Drupal 7, you have that option by default. So I'm just gonna show you guys some examples here. We saw before that it took 299 milliseconds to get this page out the door, but by turning on the Drupal cache, the Drupal normal cache in Drupal 6, we dropped that down to 79 milliseconds. And then by using Drupal aggressive, we dropped that down to 60 milliseconds. Now the difference between the two of those is that Drupal normal We'll still make a couple of database calls and make sure to check some variables and look for, um, it actually doesn't fire hook in it, but it looks for a couple of other things. You can, you can kind of get your, get, get your foot in the door on that one to make some changes. Drupal aggressive basically instantiates the database and the first thing it goes off to do is looks to see if it has that page in cache. And if it does, it gets that page, serves it, and exits. Um, but Drupal aggressive requires you to set a min and a max age to really make use out of it. Like I said, without that max age, um, 
you're not going to get things like uh, like varnish is going to be able to cache and whatnot. Um, so it's it's pretty key. And Drupal 7, um, hopefully this gets fixed soon to whoever's responsible for such things. There's no option in the interface to set an aggressive cache. You actually have to go and make some changes in your settings.php file. And if you Google or if you look on Drupal.org for Drupal 7 aggressive, it's a page written by Peter Wolan, and he has the exact instructions on what you need to do in your settings.php file to get an aggressive cache for Drupal 7. I strongly recommend an aggressive cache. I can't think of well, I can think of a couple of reasons, but they're very minor, why you wouldn't want to run aggressive. And even if you're looking there and you're looking in Drupal 6 and you see aggressive and you see all these modules listed out in red that, that are incompatible with aggressive, that doesn't mean that those modules just disintegrate and your website falls over or something like that. It just means that the hooks that they may want to run don't get called when you choose aggressive. For an example would be the statistics module. When you set the aggressive cache, um, the hook that the statistics module requires, which I believe is hook exit, to, to gather statistics just doesn't get called. It doesn't mean that something your website's going to break. It just means that those modules may not have all the functionality. So I mean, if you if you think you can get away with with without those modules having full functionality for your anonymous users, set aggressive. There's there's absolutely no reason not to do that. So the next thing up here is Apache and PHP. Now I'm talking mainly Apache. In fact, all of my tests were done in Apache because that's the one that we run the most. Sure, there's things like Light HDBD and there's Nginx and whatnot, but the folks that are running those honestly probably already know all this stuff. And in addition, there's a lot of times where you may not want to run Apache, but you have to. Maybe you need to use like the LDAP module in Apache to do some sort of reverse proxy, or sorry, mod proxy, um, and mod off in Apache, do some sort of LDAP reverse proxy authentication where you've got to get through your proxy server with storing session cookies and stuff like that, and you've just got to use Apache because they're the only ones that have that. Um, so I'm talking Apache here, and all my tests were done in Apache. And the first question with Apache is, well, do you run mod PHP or do you run fast CGI? Personally, I would almost always advocate running mod PHP. Um, mod PHP gives you a lot of benefits. One is that the Apache workers have already brought, P brought PHP up. They've got it running. Anytime Apache worker fires up, it's got PHP already running and loading in it, whereas FastCGI doesn't necessarily do that. Now, the, the flip side of that is if your website serves a lot of other stuff that's not PHP, then, it, then maybe mod PHP is a little bit detriment because Apache fires up and every single worker thread brings up PHP along with it and it serves a GIF file. And that if that happens more often than PHP files, then you know then you, you, you're going to have a problem. Although if your web server is serving gobs of non-PHP files, you really shouldn't be getting to Apache for that. You should be running a CDN or be running something like Varnish and, and serving all those files through there. The other advantage is that if you run mod PHP, every single Apache process can share memory. The peers, or more specifically, the PHP running for every Apache process can share memory. So that way, if you've got like 10 workers going on with, with uh, Apache and they're all running mod PHP, that means that if this particular one does something and it sticks it, say, for example, into APC's caches, this one can grab it as well and pull that data out. If you're running um, FCGI, then this one puts something into cache. This one has no access to it. So in fact, everything I said about PHP or about APC speeding up everything and making it wonderful per virtually goes out the door with mod FCGI. Not entirely because it's still better than having no cache at all, but none of these processes can share cache anymore. And on the flip, in addition to that, is that you know, um, most websites you're probably looking at 96 megs of RAM you want to give to APC to store stuff. Well, if you're using um, FCGI, that means every single process is going to use up to 96 megs of RAM to store its cache, which is maybe you don't have enough memory for that in your server, or maybe you didn't even think about that. You're thinking, okay, PHP is only taking you know 50 megs of RAM to load a page. I've got you know 500 megs of RAM available for PHP, therefore I can have you know X number of processes. But you forgot about the fact that APC is in there. You know, and you've, you've enabled caches for that, and you're running mod PHP, and you're like adding 40 megs of RAM to every single one of those processes, which can bring your site down if you get hammered um, in a way that you weren't expecting. And that brings us to maximum simultaneous processes. You need to understand those settings. I'm gonna get into that in a lot more detail because you can do everything right and just put one number wrong in your Apache configuration file and have your website disintegrate, and not even under heavy load in some cases. Um, you need to understand the Apache modules. I know this sounds crazy. I'm like telling you to do something you really don't wanna do, but look at the Apache modules that are running in the Apache conf file and then go to the Apache's website and read up what they do. Um, chances are you don't need half of them, but every single one of them spinning stuff up and loading into memory on every single page request and you're never gonna use it. And there's just no reason for it. Um, Pre-forked versus worker, I prefer pre-forked um, just because that way it's already done. Um, and also it, also it does depend on your operating system, um, whether or not you wanna run the, the forked Apache or if you wanna run the, uh, the threaded version of Apache. Ironically on Windows, threaded works better and um, on Linux, pre-fork works better, which is pretty much what everybody runs. And then min servers and spare servers. These, these, these two little numbers that are set in your Apache configuration file, most people are like, ah, it says eight and five. That looks good to me or something like that. 
the thing that those really do is that, the, say for example, you're, you, you have your maximum number of Apache processes set to 20, and your min is set to five and your spare is set to eight. That means that you turn on Apache and it fires up five of those processes. And then it says, um, and you get, you get slammed, and it fills up all 20. And then what it will do is it'll, it'll shut some of them off as, it, as they're not being used, and it'll, it'll drop down and keep eight in there as well. Well, the problem is that you want to keep those, you want to try and actually keep a lot more servers running, a lot more processes running for Apache. You want to have as many children as available as you think you're going to need um, at any given time. So you need to, chances are you need to up those numbers because firing up those additional processes is expensive. If you have five Apache processes running, you get 10. Each one of those additional five it needs to fire up, so you get 10 requests. Each one of those additional five it needs to fire up, it's like firing up a program. It takes as long, well, it takes less time, you know, than if you're doing it in OS, but it's like, it's like starting something up. It's actually got to fire it up, it's got to load all the modules, process the configuration files, and, and so on and so forth, and you really don't want to have to do that. And the last one is child lifetime. There's this little setting, and it says child lifetime, and I think the default is set to 10,000 in most installs. And what that means is that child process is there, and it's serving pages, and it's firing up, you know, PHP and doing all this stuff, and then it gets to 10,000. You're being slammed, by the way. Your website's just being hammered. It gets to 1,000 and says, oh, someone thought I must have a memory leak. I'll just shut down now. And it shuts down, and Apache's like, oh, I gotta fire another one up. And you're doing that probably at very inopportune times. Um, if you don't think you have memory leaks and you've watched Apache and it stays pretty stable and when it shuts off processes, the memory consumption goes back down, set that to zero. And then maybe just restart Apache manually, you know, on a, on a certain schedule or just let your ops team, if you have, have guys like that, handle that. But um, you really, you don't want to set that to something like a thousand because that means after a thousand requests, they're restarting it. Setting that number to a thousand and getting slammed will bring down your website quite likely. So, you, you know, set that to a really high number or possibly set it to zero and just have those things never restart automatically. Just wait for Apache itself to be restarted and, you know, to, to determine that. So the one of the things I, I touched on briefly here was the maximum simultaneous processes. That's really the, the most important thing. Like how many simultaneous requests are you getting? How many simultaneous processes should you be firing up to handle that? And if you get those numbers wrong, like I said, you'll bring your site down. So the first thing you need to do to understand that is you need to know, well, how much time does it take to look for me to load a page and how much memory does it take to load that page? Um, and I'm talking in, in PHP at this point. So this is the um, performance monitoring submodule that comes with Devel. Like I said, there's a lot of other ways to get these, get these numbers as well. You can use New Relic as a great tool too, but this is something that we just have all available to us. You download the module, you install it, you let it run for a while. And we'll see that on this particular website, and this was a small test website, the average memory per page is, is 11, and it takes 289 milliseconds to, to load a page. So what that tells me is that on my test server that I had with 256 megs of RAM, I can assume that I can maybe give, allow PHP to have 120 megs of RAM. That's probably being a little bit too generous. I probably don't actually have quite that much memory available for it. Um, I should also take that number and add to it because that's really, that's from hook, hook boot to hook exit. Um, that's how long, um, or how, or that's, yeah, that's how long it took for those two things to happen. But there's some stuff that happens before and after that. And there's probably a little bit of time that Apache is spending dealing with the request before and after that. So, you know, you could be safe, you could add 10 to 15% of that number, which then gives me 333 milliseconds to get the result out the door for, the, for my page loads on average on this site. Now that means that um, I can have 10 simultaneous processes running, so then ideally I will be able to serve 30 pages per second. That gives you your number, so if you, or sorry, was that minute? Yeah, yeah so it's, it's per second, so yeah, 30 pages per second. So that means this website can serve 30 pages a second, which is actually great. Now, considering this is a fairly small website and there's not a lot going on, that's going to be okay. You're going to, of course, come up with probably significantly higher numbers on this, and a lot of it will be due to your theme, believe it or not. That's what's going to chew up a lot of the RAM when it comes to loading your page. So you want to know what your, what your traffic peak is. So, Because those numbers I gave you, those numbers are probably gathered, a lot of them at times when my website's not really doing anything, which means those numbers are all ideal. So what you want to do is you actually want to use a tracking system. You can use Google Analytics, although that's not going to help you a lot if you're using page caching, um, like Varnish or something like that. Um, performance logging is a great one to use, like I showed, or you can use your web server logs. And you want to determine how many page loads you get during your peak traffic time. So say, for example, your peak traffic time is one in the afternoon. You don't want to, you, you want to get like, you want to grab the peak. So you want to grab like the top 90% or maybe even the top 95% of that peak. And you really just want to look at the numbers during that part of the peak. You don't want the whole thing because that's going to skew you. You're going to see better page load times at the bottom, and they're going to skew your numbers. You want to basically make sure that your website is going to perform perfectly at peak. Because to be honest, when you get slash dotted and 10 million people come to your website and your website falls over, that's the time your boss is going to be really pissed. They don't care as much if it crashes at 2 in the morning for some obscure reason. They don't want it to crash then. So you have to, you have to plan for your peaks. So you determine how many pages a minute you get during that peak, and you know how long it takes to generate your pages. So you can use this, this handy dandy little um, equation. 
and you can say, okay, my pages served divided by my minutes multiplied by my execution time divided by 60 will give me the concurrent processes I need to serve this request. So my example down here, I've got 2,000 page views served over five minutes. If it takes a third of a second to serve them all, then I only need 2.22 concurrent processes to, to serve these requests. So I'm going to be great because we just figured out that my, my website can, my, or we know that my web server is set to 10, so I can run 10 concurrent processes. Now this, this will bite you in the ass if you use this exactly like this because, you know, not all of your users are just waiting, you know, and making the requests, you know, in, in nice order. You might have, like, 40 people make a request all at once. So you would, uh, logically, you'd want to you'd try and work that out. You'd want to maybe try and say, okay, chances are that my, my spikes are really sharp on my web server, which means I'm getting a lot of people making simultaneous requests. Sure, I've, I've averaged them out over a particular period of time, but I know that, you know, within that five minutes, I have, I have high points in there. So you either, A, just want to multiply that number by something like four, to say, okay, you know, that's good, that will give me some headroom, or maybe you want to take a smaller sample. You want to figure out, like, you may be down to, like, half a minute how many requests you're getting in, in, your, in the top half minute of your peak and base your numbers off of that. But you want to, you know, you want to be smart about that. Um, so after setting all this stuff up on my website, I decided to hammer it. And unfortunately, this isn't well in focus for you, so you can't see it in, in great detail. But um, I use Apache Benchmark for these tests. Um, Apache Benchmark is probably not something you want to run a full-scale web test against, but it gives you really cool stats. And I like, you know, Siege doesn't seem to give sort of the level of detail that I like, or there's a setting that, that I'm unaware of. But the Mac, I made a thousand requests um, with Apache Benchmark against this server, and I requested a concurrency of 10, which means I'm being gentle on my server. I'm saying I know it can handle 10 requests at a time, so I'll only serve, I'll only ask for 10 requests at a time. So it took 21.4 seconds to serve those thousand requests, and I was actually able to serve 233 requests a second, which is pretty freaking awesome, actually, I think. And down here in the, the left-hand side, you'll see that my, my lowest request was served in six milliseconds, and 99% of the requests were served in under 89 milliseconds, which is pretty good. So the next question is, well, what can we do now? So I then said, I want to serve, I'm going to make 5,000 requests, and I'm going to request them 100 at a time. And so the interesting thing is that my website survived this, and it actually survived it fairly well. Um, it only took 28.9 milliseconds to serve 5,000 requests, whereas before I, it, you know, I served 1,000 in 21. So you look at that and you think, that's pretty good. Um, and the reason why this happens, of course, is because the operating system, when, when Apache says, hey, I'm full, I can only take 10 requests, you know, your operating system doesn't just say, sorry guys, you know, you're getting, you're getting a 500 error of some sort. It, it'll just queue them up and wait. But the thing you'll notice here is that my mean time per request is significantly worse. So I'm at 42 milliseconds to request there, and now I'm at 578 milliseconds is my mean time to serve a request, which means my users are not happy with me now. Their website, their pages are loading a lot slower than they were before. Um, and that's because most of those users are sitting in queue, waiting, you know, for, for Apache to get around to serving their requests. Apache's fine. My run queue when I ran these tests on the servers was sat around, like, I don't know, wasn't, it was like 0.8 or something like that. So it was good. But a lot of the time that my, the users were, were dealing with were spending just waiting for those requests to come through. So then just for kicks, I'm like, well, what if I take my server limit and I change it to 20? I'm like, I, I know I don't have the RAM for it, but maybe the, maybe the disk can, can handle it and I'll swap and it'll be all right. And what we'll discover is that um, it takes longer by setting it to 20, so I've actually I've actually made my I've made my test take longer, and I've made the um, the users wait longer as well. So that's kind of interesting. You know, I, I had a, I had my web server. I know my web server wasn't really adequate for the task, and I, I but I I was being you know I was setting my max limit properly. I'd done the math. I figured out how much RAM it took and how much RAM I had available, and I knew that I could handle 10 concurrent processes. Apache was not going to have to start swapping on the disk to serve those 10 concurrent processes because I had enough RAM for it. But as soon as I went over that. Now the thing starts to get worse. And if I actually set this to 40, the same test will actually bring the server down. It'll actually lock up and I'll have to reboot it when I, when I would do that. So that's, that's an important thing to understand. And just to give you guys an idea, um, the default setting in Apache typically is 150 or 256, depending on the version you pull down. So, and if you think about it, if you think your website takes 100 megs of RAM, that's, that's a conceivable number to get a page out the door and it's set to 256, you better have a lot of RAM on that machine available to serve your web request. Otherwise, Apache's just gonna say, yeah, bring them on, I can serve these requests. And then it's gonna say, shoot, I'm out of RAM. And then it falls over. So you do not want that. You, want, you need to go in there and you need to tweak that setting. The default install in Apache is designed for HTML pages. It's not designed for, for you know, a CMS like Drupal and it will, it will bring your site down. But the good news is, like I said, that you can, you can still handle you know, more traffic than you should be able to handle. Um, because if you're, if you're telling, if you're not make, forcing Apache to do too, more work than it can handle, you know, the OS will queue the requests and they'll all get through without bringing your site down. This site could have handled, you know, 100 concurrent requests for forever and it wouldn't have gone down. Now some of the users might eventually have got timeouts on the request, but the server wouldn't go down, which means that 
you know, worst case scenario, you don't have to sit there making a call to a data center getting the reboot a server in the middle of your, of your peak. You might just have a couple people that don't get pages. Obviously still not ideal, but it's better than the alternative. So after doing all of this, you then need to assume the worst. You need to assume that you just got slash dotted and you've got more requests than you've ever seen coming to your website. And like I mentioned before, that content editor sees that they've made a typo in an article and they go and edit a page and it clears cache. And suddenly Drupal has none of this data in cache, memcache has been cleared, APC has been cleared, and everything is being built up from scratch. Um, now if we remember when we go, all, if I were to go all the way back to the slide, scratch was a lot longer. Scra you know, when, I, when I'm running well, I'm able to serve requests in 42 milliseconds. When you're building things from scratch, it was taking over three seconds. So what you really should be doing is you should be going and running all of these tests that we just went, developing all of these numbers, all of this stuff with Drupal page caching turned off. Assume that someone made a mistake, someone was doing something last night and they turned off page caching and you don't have that available to you and that you're taking longer to run your request. So when you go back actually to the, um, what do I want to pop back to here? When you go back and you get your numbers from the develop module or from wherever you want to get them, make sure that when you, when you get those numbers, and maybe you have to, you have to spin up a, a test site and, and mimic the traffic to do this, but if you get those numbers you know, with page caching turned off because you need to assume that page caching is not running when, uh, when you get hit. I mean, granted that you don't, you don't ever want that to happen, but you don't want to be in that position where your servers cannot handle anything like that or, you know, or cache gets cleared or something like that. Or, or just it, it turns out that you know, a bunch of your pages, you set like a good number, you set an hour or something like that, but that number happened to coincide with the middle of a spike. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why that could happen. Now on the flip side, you could simply just go and, um, and turn off all of your caching or turn off all of those features as well, modify it, modify core, but Dries will find you and you won't like what happens. So apparently I'm actually going really long here. I just realized I hadn't looked at my time at all, but there's some, some other optimizations you can do. And one of them is that Drupal is a giant 404 handler. That's really what it does. None of the URLs you hit exist. It's a giant 404 handler where it says, okay, here's this pretend URL. I'm gonna pass that to index.php as a, as a variable and Drupal will know what to do. The problem is that if you get a website and, and someone made a mistake, there's a GIF that's not, not there anymore, you know, and there's a JPEG that's not there anymore in your, your, your CSS file, um, that means that you're actually taking three page loads to load a page because page loads up, there's missing, ink, there's missing files, and Drupal's like, well, I'm, I'm handling those files. So it, it's serving pages to the browser for a missing GIF, and it's serving a page for missing, you know, missing, missing uh, JPEG or something like that. And instead of taking, you know, in my case, um, 11 megs of RAM to load a page, it now takes 30 megs of RAM to load that page because I'm serving these 404s at the same time. So there's, um, Drupal 7 didn't quite get it in, but if you Google, uh, if you look around on Drupal.org, there's a thread on how to write some code into your settings.php to make, to basically detect um, extensions you don't want Drupal to serve with the exception of image cache URLs and serve those, you know, just as a just static little header and like a little bit of text saying this is a 404. Um, in addition, there's a module that actually I'd made called Fast 404 that you can check out as well that does that sort of thing as a module and it'll also do it for URLs. Um, you want to be careful with cookies because setting cookies will clear your varnish cache. I won't get into that in great detail. And path alias cache is a really big thing. This comes with press flow in Drupal 6. Um, so that's how you can get it there. What happens is if you think about it, every single, you got a front page, you got all of these node slash one, node slash two, node slash three, and all that sort of thing, but you've enabled um, URL aliases, then what Drupal's gonna do is for every single one of those, it's gonna make a query to the URL aliases table and say, hey, do you got an alias for this thing? And if it does, it's gonna use that alias instead. The problem is you could have hundreds of those on a page. If you're thinking about a front page of your site that's got a lot of blocks showing views and whatnot, you are gonna be making hundreds of extra queries. So the path alias cache, what it does is it says, okay, for this page, these are all the path aliases on this page. I'm gonna store them all as just one big chunk. And that way we don't have to make hundreds of queries. We can just make one query and get those out. Um, like I said, session data caching, whoops. Session data caching is something that you, uh, go back up, that you definitely wanna do. You wanna use the memcache module to do your session data caching, or you can use APC and cache router for that sort of thing. Um, examine those views, like I said, you really wanna be looking at those. If you, if you run develop and you see a bunch of views that are taking forever to load, you wanna examine those views, run the explain query against them. Um, I don't have time to talk about edge side includes, but there's a module on drupal.org called edge side include, ESI. You wanna look up that module. That module can allow you to actually use varnish and in concert with logged in users and serve them some cache data mixed in with some non-cache data and save yourself a lot of pain. And then the last thing you can always consider doing is making it so your front page is always cached regardless of who they are. I've done this before with Varnish. You could actually get away with doing this in Drupal as well, um, where you could basically just on like hook boot, you could, or you could write this in your bootstrap depending on how, you're, how you want to set this up, where you could look and say, okay, 
the, even though the user is um, authenticated, this is my front page, I'm just gonna serve them a cache page anyway, because the majority of your, your page views probably hit your front page. So that's always a, uh, a, a good option to consider. And then front end optimizations are some things you might wanna look at. I didn't wanna talk about this in great detail, but those are options. Um, the, uh, mod page speed, something that, that uh, Google has made. Mod page speed is actually what it does is in the, it's, it's in patchy module, and what, it, what it'll do is it'll say, hey, you've got like um, inline styles, I'm gonna put those in the head. And it, you, Drupal already does this for us, but it'll, it'll aggregate all of your JSS and CSS files. What it'll do as well is it'll say, oh, you've got all these CSS background images. Combines all those into one sprite and then modifies your CSS to show just what it needs to. So instead of serving like 40 files for your background images, it serves one, and your browser caches and stops making all the requests. So it's an awesome thing. Um, CDNs, reverse proxies, you know, Varnish is a big one. If you ask anybody about Varnish, they'll be able to give you a lot of details on that. And then domain sharding is a pretty cool thing too that services like Yada will offer and a couple other ones as well where a browser by default, um, it's probably getting a little bit higher in newer versions, will only make two requests at a time. So if you saw my one example there, I had 11 um, things that need to be loaded to load my page. My browser's gonna ask for those two at a time. But domain sharding, what a lot of services will do is they'll give you like, you know, you know, um, subdomain one dot your domain dot com, subdomain two dot your domain dot com, subdomain three, and they'll and actually the mod page speed module will do this in concert with some CDNs as well on the fly, and it'll rewrite your your HTML to make us uh, assets load from different subdomains, and the browser will request them all at once rather than doing them all, all in a serial fashion, and you'll get your page loading a lot faster. So that's uh, that's a pretty cool thing as well. So um, you know that's just sort of the quick summary. You know, understand what's going on under the hood, ensure everything's caching. Um, check your headers, tune MySQL, that's just an obvious thing, and use key value stores. It's, it's not rocket science, it's not um, you know, a, a terribly difficult thing, that's, that's what it would take to, uh, to make your site load that fast. So does anybody have any questions? Yes? Yes? Okay, so the, the question was that MySQL allows you to use different storage engines for different tables. This is true. You don't have to use InnoDB for everything or MyISM. You can use the in-memory storage table. Um, and that is, that is definitely an option. You could say for these, one, these particular tables that are ephemeral, and I don't care if they get wiped out with MySQL restarts, you can store them in memory. Um, the one reason why you may not want to do that is because maybe, maybe your MySQL server, you're, you're hitting it so hard that you're, you're worried about opening up more TCP IP connections and using more of its internal caching memory for dealing with that stuff. So if you use memcache, you're just sort of spreading out the load between different daemons. But the result would be the same. Provided your MySQL server had enough memory to handle that, had enough, you know, had the TCP, TCP IP sockets, it could do that just fine. Anything else? I can't see very well. Oh, yes. Um, you asked if I, I didn't mention, was it Lighty? Um, hmm? Oh, okay. Um, I, I, do, I think a lot of other web servers are great. Like I mentioned, Nginx is one a lot of people talk about too. But the one that the majority of us are gonna find ourselves running for a variety of reasons is um, Apache. If you can get away with running one of the faster, lighter web servers, you should definitely do it because they're faster and they're lighter. The downside though is that someone might, may come to you at some point and say, hey, we need to do X, Y, Z, and you're like, shoot, now we need to re-architect our entire system because we, we chose a, a server that can't do this one thing. But if you think you, if you, if you know your, your scope is fixed, it's a great option. So, anyone else? Yes. Okay. So the performance module has been removed from development. It's looking for help. So I'm not sure if you're asking me to help, but I can think about that. But if anybody's interested, that's, that's a very important module. Um, it's pretty key. Anyone else? Yes. So the question was, do I recommend MyISM or InnoDB? Um, and the big difference between those, sorry. Or, or the other way around. Um, and actually, you know, I, I work at Acquia in the, um, and I sit behind the hosting and the ops guys, and there's a lot of discussions about this, and I've always actually been a preferred MyISM. The problem is that MyISM on inserts and deletes does full table locks, whereas InnoDB does row locks. Um, there are certain tables in Drupal that perform better on MyISM than InnoDB. Um, for example, your watchdog table, um, and if you use the statistics module, your access table will actually perform better under MyISM than they will under InnoDB. So if you want to really play around and tweak and tune, you could pick certain tables and run one table on one engine and one table on another. Tables that have you know, a lot of inserts and deletes going at the same time, though, InnoDB is your best choice all the time for those. Yeah. Yes? In the in-memory the in engine? Okay, okay. 
So the, the point made was that there's a mem there's probably a there's a memory leak problem in the in memory MySQL engine, and you don't know if they solved it. Oh, in Lighty. Oh, okay. Or in Lighty, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I've, I haven't really invested, you know, played around with those a lot. I do pretty much everything in Apache, so. But yeah, you definitely, that's the other thing too, is that with Apache, you know that it's gonna be fairly solid, and if there are problems, there's gonna be a thousand forum posts explaining them. So that's a, one of the reasons why it's better too. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and uh, go and take the survey. If you like my presentation, you'd like to see more, give me good marks. Thanks. Have a good, have a good session, or a good DrupalCon.